Hey everyone, it's Bella and welcome back to another mystery video. I hope you're all having an incredible day. So jumping straight in today, we're going to be talking about the disappearance of Candace Hilt. She was born on the 22nd of December in 1988 in Cannon City in Colorado. Um, her mother Dolores said that the day she was brought home from the hospital, she and her husband put her under the Christmas tree so that when her siblings woke up, they'd find her new sister or their new sister as a little Christmas gift, which I think is so sweet. Unfortunately, when Candace was just five years old, her father passed away, so she only had really vague memories of him. But despite that, she was really smart from a really young age. She was described as a child prodigy. She was actively performing or doing calculus from age 11. She grew up around a lot of brothers, so she was a bit of a tomboy. She even did some bodybuilding and she did have a feminine side though. She loved jewelry, especially necklaces. She had these necklaces which she called ball necklaces and they were just like necklaces with a bunch of beads on them and she was described as intelligent and funny and headstrong and fierce and she also was really passionate about justice and doing the right thing and everything being fair for everybody. She would always stand up for school bullies and it was actually her dream to not only go to Stanford Law but become a Supreme Court Justice and she was well on her way to going. She was in her third year of Birmingham Young University when she was just 17 years old and she actually did later get accepted into Stanford but she ended up falling pregnant when she was 17 and so she decided to transfer her schooling to online schooling so that she could stay home and raise her child. In September of 2015, she gave birth to her daughter Paige, who was born with hydrocephaly, which is an abnormal buildup of cerebral spinal fluid in the centricles of the brain, which can lead to a developmental delays, brain damage, and unfortunately even death. So Candace was definitely determined to make the most of her time with Paige. She just wanted to make every moment with her daughter count because she knew that her time was limited due to her illness, unfortunately. So she would celebrate every milestone and cherish every memory and every week was like a birthday. And unfortunately, her daughter Paige would actually end up outliving her. Her mother Dolores raised her until she was seven years old when Paige unfortunately passed away due to her illness. Candace also had an older brother named James and he had severe psychological issues. He was extremely paranoid around other people to the point where it could be described as a phobia and it was so bad that he couldn't even be around his own family. He couldn't work a normal job and he actually lived in a tent by himself in the woods behind his family home and Candace was extremely defensive of him. Okay, um, I apologize if you can hear that in the background. My neighbor has been power washing for the past five hours hours the same spot I'm not sure if he's just trying to piss his neighbors off or if it takes five hours to power wash an archway but I'm sorry for the background noise so on the 10th of August in 2006 Fremont County Sheriff's Deputy Robert Dodd stop in the name of Plod <laughs> does anyone remember that show um, he arrived at the Hilt's home, which was in a remote wooded location in the Copper Gulch area. And he came home looking for James to question him in regards to a trespassing incident that had happened. Instead, he ended up talking to Candace and her mother Dolores. And at some point during the conversation, Candace ended up getting really angry at Dodd's line of questioning and his demeanor and the way that he was speaking to her mother. Eventually, she started yelling at him and he told her that if she couldn't contain her anger, he would have to arrest her. Now, in response, apparently Candace held her wrists out and told him to to just arrest her and she also said that if he were to arrest her that she'd seen him around town accepting some envelopes from some known drug dealers around town and if he wanted to arrest her she would just go and tell the other sheriff's deputies and he apparently got really annoyed with what she was saying and then angrily stormed away. Several days after this conversation, the Hilt's family's dog went missing and Catherine Paver, which was Candace's cousin, said that they lived in the country. So when the dog went missing, they just assumed it was like a mountain lion or something. According to Kathleen, after their dog went missing, Candace went down to the sheriff's department and got into a bit of an altercation with another sheriff's deputy, which I think was Dodd, but this was unconfirmed. 
On the 15th of August in 2006, Dolores had to go and run some errands and she was a little bit worried about leaving Candace home alone just because the dog had gone missing, which I read that it, like, it wasn't that big of a concern when a dog went missing because they thought it was like a mountain lion or that maybe it would come back because they did live in the wilderness, but they just had a really bad feeling about that and they also had the altercation with Dodd, so she was just a little worried. I'm feeling like the altercation must have been a lot bigger than what I was picking up on in my research because she was really concerned to leave her home alone and she decided to leave her home with Paige who was 11 months old at the time and the first time she saw Candace that day was at noon and because she just had this uneasy feeling she got her neighbor or asked her neighbor to be able to go and check in on Candace while she was out for the day. Now from here the timeline of events splits into two different timelines. There is the timeline of Dolores and then there is the timeline of the Fremont County Sheriff's Department. So according to one timeline, the family friend who was the son of their neighbor went over to check on Candace and he found a completely empty house except for the baby who was in her crib crying and screaming. Apparently he took the baby to his house to try and calm her down because he couldn't find Candace anywhere and he waited there with Paige until Dolores got home at around 3.30 p.m. Dolores claims that when she got home, she could hear Paige crying and screaming and she saw blood splatter everywhere as well as pools of blood, but initially she didn't see any signs of Candace. She rushed to the bedroom where Paige was, where her crib was, and when she got in there, she saw under the main bed, Candace's bed, like a rolled up green comforter. She approached the comforter and when she did, she found Candace and she said that Candace had been shot so many times that about 75% of her head was gone and the trauma was so bad to her head that it was described as severe decapitation and Candace just slumped to the ground and was crying, of course, like she just found her daughter totally mutilated. The sheriff's department was then contacted and the two deputies that were put on the case were Deputy Bisco and Deputy Dodd. Now, according to witnesses and according to Dolores, the investigation was shitty. Just from the start, it was a shitty investigation. They didn't cross it off as a crime scene. They ordered the family to get out of the house, but they didn't cut it off as a crime scene. So people were free to come and go as they pleased. Almost immediately, for unknown reasons, the deputies decided that Candace had been murdered by her brother James, and so there was an official manhunt for James Hills. During the initial stages of the investigation, they searched the wooded area for any signs that somebody had been there, and a lot of people said that the investigation was more about finding James than it was about finding clues as to who murdered Candace. They just immediately said, this was probably James, let's find him. Like they didn't decide, like they just had tunnel vision basically and they weren't looking for other clues or who else it may be. They just decided he was their guy. During their search efforts for James, they also found the Hiltz family dog and he was tied up to a tree uh, with rope and was butchered using a hatchet or a small ax. And immediately this raised questions because some people thought that whoever murdered Candace had premeditated it and they had murdered the dog so that they could quietly get in and out without the dog making any noise or making any, making their murdering Candace more difficult for them. In following up their theory of the case, they decided to question the family on James's whereabouts or any known associates, but because of his psychological issues he didn't have any you know known associates they also wouldn't know where he is most of the time because he doesn't like to be around other people and they started to worry about the direction that the investigation was going and James also had no history of violence now Dolores obviously tried to explain the mental illness to the officers she said that he had been in and out of the Colorado Mental Health Institute due to his issues she said he suffered from severe issues and that he didn't even come inside the house he doesn't talk to the family he doesn't think she's his mother and that some other woman has replaced her 
and the back door of the home was pried open with a breaker bar but James would only come into the house when no one else was there and there was a butter knife which they hid under the front doorstep which he would use to open the front door. Now the conversation between Dolores and investigators lasted over four hours. It didn't change the course of their investigation at all. It didn't change their minds whatsoever even though she told them that he didn't have a firearm. He had no means to be able to get a firearm. Um, he had no history of violence, anything like that, but they were just kind of stuck in their ways that this was their guy. After they examined the crime scene, the family was allowed back home, and this is when Dolores realized how shitty of a job that these deputies and these officers had done. When they got home, the back door was wide open, there was no crime scene tape, she found a shotgun shell inside Paige's crib, as well as shotgun shells at around their fireplace. Like, there was just so much evidence that they had missed. The blood-soaked comforter which Candace was wrapped in was left there. There was also towels that looked like they'd been handled by the killer. They had some blood on them and they were just left outside the house as well. They even found a blood soaked shirt which Candace had been wearing that day. So apparently they really didn't take a lot of evidence with them at all. She was just shocked at all of the evidence that they had left behind and one of her sons was actually in a forensic class so they decided to take matters into their own hands and they got some rubber gloves and they photographed it and filed it and you know put it in bags and everything like that that you were meant to do at a crime scene and then they took it to the police and she was just demanding answers as to why there was so much left behind. She asked to speak to deputies Dodd and Briscoe and apparently neither of them wanted to speak to her. They said they were too busy so she said she would sit there and she would wait which is when a young man came out to talk to her and she left. She told them what had happened and then she left and nobody called her back and then eventually Briscoe ended up showing up at the house with a search warrant demanding the container of evidence after he said he was too busy. Police ended up issuing a statement saying that they were on a manhunt for James Hiltz, that he could be armed and dangerous either with a rifle or a 22 caliber handgun, and then three days later on the 15th of August they found him. He was camping in the Copper Gulch Iron Mountain area west of Cannon City and despite the belief that he was involved in the murder, he was charged with first and second degree burglary and criminal trespassing, both of which are felonies. In addition, he was also charged with theft and criminal mischief. And according to the sheriff's department, they believe James broke into a home where he stole hatchets and flashlights. He was held on a $500,000 bond. And despite the fact that he has never been charged with anything to do with Candace's murder, he is still listed as the prime suspect. When he was taken into custody, he had no firearms like they said that they believed he possessed, even though Dolores told them he didn't have one, he didn't have any access to any, um, and his charges were all dropped by reason of insanity, and he was taken to the corrupt. Colorado Mental Health Institute and Dolores claims that every time he comes up for a review deputies from the Fremont County Sheriff's Office arrive and speak out against his release stating he remains a suspect in the murder of his sister. Like it just seems like they really don't like this guy. An 11 page autopsy was released for Candace's murder. She was shot seven times, six in the head and one in the chest and she was shot by three different guns. A shotgun, a medium caliber gun and a small caliber gun. It was also noted that she had been shot from both the front and the back and that she had been shot from the, f the back once with a shotgun and from the front five times with the small caliber gun. She was also shot once in the chest with the medium caliber gun. According to the blood spatter analysis, she was shot by at least two people, but at most three people. Now, in the family's minds, this completely ruled James out because he doesn't like people, so he wouldn't have been with somebody else to have shot her, L like even if he was to shoot her, which the family thinks is very unlikely, he wouldn't have been with anybody else. So in their minds, he was completely innocent and there was no way that he did that. So while the report says that there were three different weapons, Dolores says that she only found shell casings for two different weapons, a 22 caliber gun and a shotgun. She believes that one of the killers stood in front of Candace and one stood behind her on a love seat so he was like a bit above her or they were a bit above her and that is how they shot her from a bit of a downward trajectory. 
but I couldn't find anywhere if there was only two bullets, if th maybe they had taken the third like shell casings with them and not taken the other two shell casings and so that's why Dolores only found two. I think it's a possibility, but I'm not sure. In addition to this, it's been suggested that Candace received two blows to the head with the gunshots and then multiple small caliber gunshots to the back of her head and then with the medium caliber gun she was shot from the side including on her hand. She had around 8 to 10 22 caliber shotguns in her sides and Dolores believes that this was from two people who were shooting her simultaneously. She said that when they were dragging her body down the stairs she believes she had death tremors and that's why there are like some wavy blood markings on the walls. There were also some towels and some laundry which was sitting on top of her dryer which apparently the killer had taken to clean himself off. They put them in a garbage bag and then they dumped them at a nearby trail which Dolores found and identified as her own. And she also said that when the towels were tested for DNA, they found that there was DNA on there from an unknown male, so not from anybody in her family. The disagreements between the Hilts family and the Sheriff's Department continued for years. There wasn't much of an investigation. They still believed that James was 100% their guy, despite the fact that there was evidence that more than one person had to have been there to shoot her. So Dolores ended up filing a formal complaint against the Sheriff's Department with the Attorney General and also put forward the theory that one of the deputies might even be involved in the murder. Now for the next 10 years there wasn't a lot in terms of investigation, there wasn't a lot of leads until December of 2016. On December 17th there was a Dawson Ranch mini storage which is a storage unit facility where they were conducting auctions on units whose owners had fallen behind on payments and there was a guy named Rick Ratzlav and he was a former streetcar racer. He also had some bad run-ins and had a bad reputation with the Fremont Sheriff's Deputies Department. There was one auction um, on one of the units in particular and you weren't allowed to go inside them but you were allowed to look from the outside and make a bid then and there was one unit that Ratzlaff had seen and he saw some police lights in there so he decided to make a bid for $50 for the unit which he won. Now when he got in there he started to notice that there were envelopes with evidence written on them, there were little boxes with like shell casings and bloody, bloody clothes and evidence in this storage locker. He also found a bloody piece of rope, two bloodstained stocked socks and a chrome axe which was also covered in blood. He also found Fremont County Sheriff's Department gear like their uniforms, their sirens and their lights from their vehicles. Now he immediately contacted the Fremont Sheriff's Department and he got in contact with Jim Beaker who was the sheriff and he said that he believed that evidence was in relation to the Candace Hiltz murder case. Ratzlav also said that in his conversation with Beaker that it sounded like he was threatening him and he was telling him that his life could be in danger because of the contents that he had found in the storage locker. Which to me it seems like maybe you should have kept paying for your storage locker so this didn't happen. It wasn't Beaker's storage locker though. Now sometime after this conversation with Beaker, Detective Dodd and his family started contacting Ratzlav because it was Dodd's storage locker. They started contacting him to try and buy the contents of the storage locker back, saying that it had childhood memories in it. And it's like, if it had childhood memories in it, why didn't you just continue paying for the storage locker? Or why didn't you take the stuff out of it and then stop paying for it? It kind of seems like you're bad. They were contacting him on Facebook. Apparently he didn't use Facebook much. So then he started getting harassed by the sheriff's department. So eventually he invited Sheriff Beaker to come down and have a look at the con the contents of the storage locker, but he just had a really sketchy feeling about it, especially because he had like been threatening him on the phone earlier and they'd been harassing him. So he got his wife to secretly record it. Sheriff Beaker said that following his examination of the storage locker that he handed all of the on uh, contents over to the Colorado Bureau of Investigations and that he photographed and examined all of the evidence before handing it over to the CVI who would be taking over the case from now on and 
uh, Deputy Dodd was also placed on administrative leave pending the outcome of the investigation. Now, the rope and the axe were actually what was used to murder the Hiltz family's dog and the bloody socks that were found were Candace's and according to Dolores, they were the ones that she was wearing when she was murdered. But the family didn't find out about the evidence from the sheriff's department or from the CBI. They had to find out through the media. Now, it's pretty obvious that Dodd had to have stolen this evidence from the sheriff's department's evidence locker. And he either would have had to do that to hide evidence to protect himself or to protect somebody else. So it just kind of reinforced her belief that somebody from the sheriff's department was involved in her daughter's murder. In February of the next year, in 2017, Detective Deputy Briscoe was also placed on administrative leave pending an investigation by the CBI who had determined or were investigating some claims that he had had an inappropriate relationship with an underaged woman when he was working as a drug abuse resistance officer in 1999. However, the woman that he apparently had this affair or had this relationship with, this inappropriate relationship with, decided not to press charges and so he was reinstated and still works for the department. On April 23rd, Dodd decided to retire and move to Texas and then less than a month later, on the 4th of May, he was charged with two counts of second degree misconduct and abuse of public records. Now, these charges stemmed from not only all of the items that were found in the storage locker, but also another incident where he changed public records that he didn't have the authority to change. On the 17th of May, new evidence was found in the Phantom Landfill in Penrose. A man named Robert Proton, um, who was a worker at the landfill, called Rick Ratzlav and stated that they'd picked up a dumpster from Dodd's private residence. And the landfill is required to check for hazmat items and all dumpsters they retrieve. And inside of Dodd's, they found a fat envelope with what looked to be a criminal investigation paperwork, a videotape relating to a sexual offense investigation and a computer. Orton said that he did try and contact the DA's office, but when he didn't get a response from them and he couldn't get through to them, he contacted Ratzlav, who then contacted Tracy Harmon, who was a reporter for the Pueblo Chaferton, I think. I'm, I'm not very good at pronunciation. Harmon then arrived at the landfill and they tried to contact the DA, but once again, couldn't get through. So they started going through the evidence themselves. So they found an envelope and this envelope had a DVD inside and it also had a videotape, which marked that it was to do with a sexual assault case. And they also found a tackle box, which was marked FCSO crime scene unit forensic lights. And the DA eventually called Harmon and instructed the DA's investigator, Richard Wen, to come and collect the evidence that they'd found. On June 6th in 2017, Dodd was supposed to appear before the court, um, but instead he had his attorney, Randy Jorgensen, appear before the court, who set a date for a pretrial conference on the 17th of July. On the 8th of June, the DA announced that they were launching a second in investigation into the incident and the evidence that was found inside the landfill. Then on Wednesday, the 30th of August, Dodd had a pretrial that he was meant to go to, but only appeared via a telephone and at this time, his attorney said that the DA had offered a plea bargain and that he was going to discuss it with his client. Now, the alleged corruption of the Fremont Sheriff's Department was huge. And it, it ended up in this massive public outcry. Jim Beaker, who was the sheriff, was apparently the most corrupt guy of them all. And everybody seemed to have known it. There was also a petition raised to have him removed as sheriff for these reasons. Give me a second. For the impounding of Rick's Ratlav's vehicles, failure to follow up on investigative crimes reported, the murder of Candace Hiltz, the 2004 case of Gene Fish, a missing federal agent under Dodd's control, the death of inmate John Patrick Walter in which Beaker is named as a defendant in a wrongful death lawsuit, the case of Christine Humphrey, a daycare worker who was charged with neglect resulting in death. So he was a corrupt guy. The whole like Fremont County Sheriff's Department seemed like a corrupt place. So incredibly sus that they had all of this stuff in evidence and 
I mean, to me, I just can't really see another option other than the detective was involved in this crime. It just, like, nothing else points to anybody else. So, in saying that, let's talk about some theories. So the first bit, so the first theory is something that I don't find very likely, and that is that she was murdered by somebody that nobody even would think about. It was just a random person. It was like a home invasion or a robbery that had gone wrong. Um, but it just, it seems really unlikely because the dog was murdered, which seems like they must, because... I don't know if you guys knew this, but this is, there's this huge statistic that if you have a dog, you are less likely to be broken into because robbers tend to avoid houses with dogs because it'll cause more of a fuss and it'll be harder for them to just get in, rob you and get out. So it seems really sus that the dog was killed the day before. It seems like that was something that was done maliciously, that it was premeditated so that they wouldn't have any troubles getting in and out and nobody would hear them. You know, the dog wouldn't alert anybody. And I also find it really sus the amount of just like shitty police work done, you know, the amount of evidence that was left behind, all of that kind of stuff. It just it definitely seems like this was something that was premeditated. It definitely seems like this wasn't just a robbery that had gone wrong. And I think you guys can probably agree with me on that. The second theory is that it may have been Paige's father. Um, I couldn't really find a lot of information on Paige's father though, but um, you know, some theories think that maybe he didn't want the child in the first place and, and maybe he decided to take his anger on the situation out on Candace, but again, I don't know, it seems unlikely, especially if it was over having a child that he didn't want because Paige was already 11 months old at the time. The next theory, again, I don't think is very likely and it's that it was James Hilt. I just don't see any evidence towards this at all. From all of the evidence that was gathered, it seems like there had to have been at least two perpetrators and at most three perpetrators and there's just no way he would have done that. I mean, first of all, he doesn't like being in the house. I mean, I can see that maybe he would have shot her because he was in the house and maybe she was there and he didn't like that and his paranoia led him to kill her, but I just don't see that, um, especially considering it seems like there had to have been more than one person involved in the murder. And it seems like they had some sort of agreement going on where he would enter the house when he knew nobody was there. So it just doesn't really seem like he had any reason to murder her. Now, of course, the last theory is the one that I believe. And it is the fact that this could have been one of the sheriff's department. It could have been specifically Dodd, maybe Briscoe, maybe both of them. Um, maybe they had some mates come and help them. Maybe they sent somebody to go and do it for them. But either way, I just think too much like looks too shady for it not to have been them. I know that it doesn't seem like much that they had this little fight and whatever, but you know, the fight could have been a lot bigger than it's being portrayed. And it seems like maybe that's why they are so persistent that James is the lead suspect and they don't want him to get out because just immediately, they didn't look into any other possibilities. They were like, James, James is the guy, that's it. Like that's, they just beeline for him. They had tunnel vision for him and it was almost immediate. And to me, that just seems like they were looking to pin it on somebody else because it was them, you know? And what other reason would he have to hide all of this evidence in the storage locker? It just doesn't make any sense unless he had something to do with it. So in my personal opinion, that's the theory I believe. But I would love to know your thoughts on the case, what theory you believe, if maybe you believe a theory I didn't mention. As always, thank you guys for watching and hopefully I will see you in my next video. Bye guys.